Back to your seats now for the second half of the arena, armed with new guests, new ideas, new discourse, and of course, another reason for us all to live well. First up, the senior policy analyst for the Independent Women's Forum, still perhaps reeling and coming out of her shell after the North Carolina Tar Heels failed to advance to the Elite Eight. Hadley Heath Manning, now we know where she went to college. And back here in the studio with more than just money opinions, veteran economist safe and secure in the fact that his Cubs will probably not make the playoffs this year. But he's okay because he knows my Bruins in hockey are struggling to make the grade right now. Steve Beeman joins us here in studio. I had to get the Cub reference in there, there very quickly. All right, let's go ahead and start. Hadley Heath, I'm going to go ahead and throw this one to you first because here we have the Benghazi committee now is once again saying, Hillary Clinton, we want you here. You've got to explain to us again all about your servers and your emails. Does anybody really think, first of all, that Mrs. Clinton will want to appear in front of any sort of Benghazi committee at this point? Uh, no, actually. <laughs> I think that, uh, first of all, Ed, I have to say it's a great day to be a North Carolina Tar Heel. It's always a good day to be a Tar Heel, regardless of how the big dance turned out for my team. So that's unfair picking on me in that instance. But I will say about Hillary Clinton, she is feeling herself to be in a difficult situation. Uh, as chairman of that committee, uh, Trey Gowdy, who's really been the ringleader on investigating what happened in Benghazi and now summoning Clinton to give a transcribed interview about what what happened with her emails and, and whether or not she'll provide access to that server. Of course, um, Ms. Clinton's lawyers don't want any independent person to have access to that server. Um, ultimately could lead to a subpoena of that information, but of course she doesn't want that information to be publicized. She doesn't want this hearing or, or any testimony she might give to the panel to be uh, publicized because she wants to move on beyond all of this controversy about her emails as quickly as possible, especially if she's going to be announcing a 2016 presidential run. But you you know, Hadley Heath, and I think it's fair, Steve, to you as well, there's no way that she's going to be able to outrun this because the Republicans and the Hillary Clinton competition will want this living as long as they possibly can. Clearly, they're going to go after this email server. Now, the question will be whether she gives it up, number one. And number two, according to the Clinton camp, they've wiped it clean. So there's a forensic question here of whether email is ever really gone or whether there's still traces of those emails on that server. But I think there's no question the Republicans in Congress are going to pursue this for as long as they can. And it's working. If you look at Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Florida, and the way the electorate's working right now, her negative ratings are skyrocketing. In fact, I just saw that in Florida, Jeb Bush is actually leading her. Well, but that's just it. First of all, it doesn't make a difference. The polls keep coming in. The numbers keep coming in, Steve. They say that Hillary Clinton is just as popular now as she was before. Maybe a little erosion here at the corners, but the people who believe in her are going to stick with her. Frankly, I think whether it's Benghazi, email servers, or anything else, you can throw whatever you want. She seems to be Teflon at this point. Well, you are right that the core of the voters will stay with their core candidate no matter what comes out she could you know be responsible for the Holocaust they'd still support her it wouldn't matter but the reality is at the margin for that middle voter who's saying I want someone I can trust above all I think this is material because it goes right to the point of her being trustworthy. Now, this is a good point. Hadley Heath, when it comes down to trust, let's face it, we all talk about this over and over again about how much we want to trust our politicians. But there have been many serious questions on Mrs. Clinton's trust. Is it fair to say that when it comes to the Democrats right now, they'll want to make sure that Mrs. Clinton gets in because they don't feel as if anybody else even has a chance of winning? No, and to use a basketball analogy, they have a very short bench, I would say, while Republicans are, are looking at a very long, very deep bench. They don't have really much of a bench at all, if you think about it, because O'Malley is out there right now. Elizabeth Warren says she doesn't want to run. There really isn't anybody. But Hadley Heath, let's put it very plain here. On that bench, you've got to have a heck of a wallet behind you. And there's oh, nobody on that bench right now that's got money. Well, and let's remember that what we're hearing about Hillary Clinton right now, whether it's, you know, Chairman Trey Gowdy asking to, for her to testify about her emails. This is all in the media. This is all news. They're newsworthy events. But when we get closer to election day, um, if Hillary Clinton is running, there's going to be big money behind ads that will continue to bring up any baggage that any candidate brings to any race. And of course, Mrs. Clinton, because she's been in public office many times, because she's been in the public realm, she has a lot of baggage and anything that she has on her record is going to be repeated not just in the news media, but during those commercial breaks. Anytime that our Republican sponsors an ad, they're going to be reminding the public about these trust issues. Did she or did she not, you know, make good decisions as Secretary of State? And would she be a person worthy of the office of president? 
Uh, Ten seconds. Uh, to your point about money, because I love to talk about money, <laughs> we're looking at a billion and a half dollar war chest on the part of Hillary Clinton, potentially. That's an awfully big hurdle. No matter how dishonest she may be or how much they paint her, that's a lot of money to overcome. If Elizabeth Warren can get that much, then she would be lucky indeed. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll come back, and when we do, a lot of what's happening in Indiana right now has the entire nation talking. We'll focus on that, plus much more when the arena continues right here on Midpoint. All right, back to business in the arena. Welcome back, senior policy analyst for the Independent Women's Forum, Hadley Heath Manning, and veteran economist Steve Beeman joins us here in the studio. Steve, let's get to you first this time. The New York Times is now reporting that Lufthansa Airlines knew that the pilot of the doomed plane, the German Wings flight that crashed into the Alps, was suffering from depression. That opens up a tremendous amount of new avenues here. It, uh, this has been widely reported in the last couple of days because you've got what is in essence a civil rights issue. Whether or not a company, knowing that a person suffers from depression, can in any way discriminate against them for their activities. And it's been a question in the airlines. If you take your medicine or don't take your medicine, what that does to the pilot. And I wouldn't claim to be a psychologist, but I've dealt with depression with some of the people I know. And the medicines they take can be very severe and very impactive on daily performance. I think that's part of it, though, because the employer will then will state, we don't really know. We know about a malady here that may affect the safety of the people. Because let's again be very honest here and blunt. He had 149 lives in his hands. And if something happens... Those are people that deserve to get the greatest protection possible from the airline. No question about that. And that's why this opens up a can of worms on to what extent the airline is responsible for a medical condition. And can they, again, discriminate against someone who's under clinical control and taking the medications as prescribed that ostensibly make this better? But what are they going to do, blood tests on their pilots to make sure they took their medicine? Well, I think this comes down to the, the issue of discrimination here, Hadley Heath. Are you discriminating against someone if you know they suffer from an ailment that perhaps could impact their judgment? That could, And again, I'm being very sensitive here to people who do suffer from depression. And again, Steve knows something. I have friends who suffer from this. I know all about this. But if you have somebody who has lives in their hands and you're an employer, don't you have to take some sort of action? Well, I think you do, and we do want to be very careful to recognize that many, many people have struggled with depression, and many people have family members who have struggled with it. And, and as a society, I think we want to, to move away from having any type of stigma attached to mental illness. I think it's very important to talk about it openly and to not stigmatize people who have struggled with any type of, of mental illness or depression. So, of course, it depends, in my mind, on the job and the responsibilities of the job and whether or not you know, having any type of record of, of mental illness is relevant to the job. And of course, if you're a pilot, you are responsible for the lives of, of the people on board the plane, and it becomes a safety issue. Of course, it, come, it becomes a, a health privacy issue as well. If employers want to ask for that type of information about your history with mental illness or about your current struggle with mental illness, then I, I believe ultimately it boils down to what the responsibilities and, and roles of the person in the particular position and the particular job are. It's not something that I believe should be far-reaching, that every employer has a right to know all of this information about our health care or our health history. Um, but in this case, certainly, when you have that type of responsibility, I believe it's relevant. i got about 60 seconds left. Here's discrimination of another sort that we're now talking about here in Indiana. Hadley Heath, Governor Mike Pence then comes out and says, this is not fair. We are not being held to a fair line here. We have people who are attacking us. And what we're doing here with the Religious Freedom Restoration Act is not discrimination. In your opinion, is it? No. In fact, I don't think this Religious Freedom Restoration Act in Indiana is necessarily anything new. I think there are some new tactics politically to attack the law and to talk about the law as if it were discriminatory. Um, I think there may be adding some additional language to the law in Indiana to clarify that they don't want this to be used to discriminate against any certain types of people. Um, but of course, this, this boils down to a political issue where now uh, conservatives who, who were on the offense in Indiana passing this law have been playing defense this week, trying to clarify that the law's intention is not to provide cover for those who might discriminate. 30 seconds. What do you think, Steve? Political? I think it's extremely political, and you're seeing the intersection, or I should say the, the hitting of two very disparate views. One that says, I have a constitutional freedom to religion. The other saying that I can infer a constitutional right to behavior. 
And as those two things collide, this is the beginning of a can of worms we're not going to see go away, but it will ultimately be a political decision. I think the interesting thing, too, is Mike Pence, when he first came out, he said, this is the law. We don't have to fix it. Now he's got to fix it. He, he and, backed and up I, real quick. He backed that. up real quick. And it has me even asking if the law wasn't right in the first place, why did you sign it in the first place? There are a lot of questions on that, but again, yeah. we'll see where it goes. We're going to continue to ask a lot of those questions. We're going to ask a few more here as the arena continues, including is it time to go back to the draft in the United States? Ooh, that's frightening. Wait until midpoint continues. Back to business in the arena. Welcome back. Senior policy analyst for the Independent Women's Forum, Hadley Heath Manning, and veteran economist Steve Beeman joins us here in the studio. Hadley Heath, we got a few things to get through. Let's go ahead and see if we can rock them all here in the last segment. Interesting. ISIS is tweeting out photos of a military graduation showing their latest graduating class, all brand new, wonderfully, perfectly scrubbed terrorists ready to go. First of all, do we even believe that this is really a school? And second of all, should we be showing these pictures or are we just buying into their rhetoric? I can believe it's a real school. Madrasas or Islamic schools across the um, Central Asian area and the, and the Middle East have been in place for many years, although it seems, of course, with ISIS, they've ticked up their uh, militarism and focus on terrorism and jihad. And I believe these photos show us just how organized and how serious our foe is, especially when it comes to the level of indoctrination. But should we be publicizing them? Should we be showing these pictures? You know, I think it's important that Americans know the truth of what kind of enemies we face, that it is a very serious conflict. So I have no problem showing the photos. See, I got to agree with that, Steve. To me, I'm one of those guys who says, show me the evil, because that's what people really need to I see. I agree with Hadley on this. I think, first, we have to acknowledge they are schools, and they're terrorism schools at the core. And to shine the light on evil awakens the people to what it really is. And ISIS is an evil ideology. There's no question about it. It's a foe that we're going to have for many, many years to come, if not decades. And I think the only way to fight it is to wake up the American people and people around the world to the evil that does exist there. And it is, at its core, it's an evil thing. Here's hoping we have a society, though, that wants to be enlightened at times. That's an entirely different <laughs> That's thing. That's why you have the program. That's exactly right. The U.S. Defense Chief says there are plenty of challenges ahead on military recruitment, basically saying they have to lower their standards. Okay, I'm going to say a really dirty word here that hasn't been around in America since the 70s, draft. Maybe it's time to have young people serve a couple of years in the military. Uh, first reaction to that is not a chance. You're not going to get a well, draft Well, I didn't say there's back. a chance. You're right. It's not a chance. Right. But would it be the best thing to do instead of lowering standards for our military? Uh, I think you could argue that it is. But I think the technology development of the military is lowering manpower requirements across the board. And we have foes now in China that's now releasing a whole big new Navy that we're acknowledging for the first time. Maybe China's not our friend. Yes, they're a trading partner, but they're not our friend. Europe, we've got issues. So the military has to sustain its force strength. I don't know that a draft is the way to do it. I, or conscription, I, something serve a couple of years for your country. I wouldn't argue with it from a pure nationalistic perspective. I don't know that it will solve the problem the military has. All right, Hadley Heath, what do you think? I think before we consider conscription or any um, requirement to serve in the military, we've got to consider all of our other options, including financial incentives such as the GI Bill or participation in ROTC. I mean, these are wonderful opportunities for a lot of young Americans to go to college and to find opportunities uh, to work in a military career. So first, I think we emphasize those things. Military is not for everybody. Perfectly said indeed. All right, 60 seconds left. Here we go. Last thing. McDonald's is going to have an all-day breakfast. Hadley Heath, can't you just wait to go at 6 or 7.30 at night and make sure that you get yourself some McMuffin? I give this a thumbs up. I hope you have a really? seen the movie. Uh, yes, I think this is a great thing. My Actually, my husband is, is asleep right now. He's uh, working nights all night at the hospital. Americans are working on very diverse work schedules, whether they work from home or they use technology to telecommute. So if you want a breakfast sandwich at night, I say God bless. I'm glad McDonald's is offering you that opportunity. Do you trust the quality of the food at a McDonald's? I do. I, I like to eat fast food occasionally. I think everything in moderation. Okay. And you, I bet you, because <laughs> you're, you're Mr. Coffee injected into the veins. You probably love this idea. I like McDonald's, but the business of the business is what matters here. McDonald's has seen a slowing of their business worldwide. They've got competition from Starbucks and from all these other franchises that have come up. Going to breakfast full day is a smart business move. They will increase per store sales by doing this. And I think most people, notwithstanding those of you who are healthy and you're living, Thank you. Most people support McDonald's, generally speaking. Real quick, where's your favorite breakfast sandwich? Fast McDonald's. Food. McDonald's. <laughs> Hadley Heath, your favorite breakfast sandwich. You're always going to get one. 
Bojangles. It's the southeastern fried chicken chain. That's interesting. Okay, you're going for the Cajun. I have to go. This is my northeastern roots. Dunkin' Donuts. There you go. Got to walk right in and do it. There you go. See, Hadley, she's probably, you're a Starbucks person, aren't you? I'm a, I, if, I, if I'm getting a donut, <laughs> I'm getting a Krispy Kreme. Oh, even better. But see, I don't do the donuts. Another story. Hadley Heath, always a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks so much for joining us. Steve Beeman, pleasure, my friend. Thanks it's so much for being here nice today. To be here. And we will always see you on this program. All right. Coming up next, very simply put, the third hour of Midpoint.